This is not, uh, did everybody hear that sound? Yes, okay. I'll tell you a little bit about that later, but that's not an ordinary sound. That's actually a sound generated by a star that's many, many light years from here. But first I'd like to ask you a question. Have you ever laid back on the cool green grass on a summer night, looking up into the stars, asking the question, are there other worlds out there? Are those small pinpoints of light that dot the sky campfires for other beings like us to warm our toes? Well, are there other worlds out there unseen and uncounted against the rich, rich velvet black night of the sky? So we're on the threshold of answering this question. Are there other worlds like Earth out there? And today I'd like to tell you about the challenges that we face with the data and the discoveries that we're making. So Kepler is NASA's first mission capable of finding Earth-sized planets transiting other worlds in the habitable zone. That range of distances from a star for which liquid water could pull on the surface. And as far as we know, that's the one ingredient that's common to all life forms. Now Kepler stares at a very large field of view, looking for instances when a planet crosses in front of its star, blocking a small fraction of light, as you can see in this cartoon on the left. Now, we can't see the planets, and we can't even see the disk of the star, but Kepler can measure the brightness of each of its stars very carefully, looking for small dips in the light curve corresponding to times when the planet does block the light. Now, how hard is it to find good planets like the Earth? Well, here's an image of the Sun, and it's got a silhouette the size of Jupiter in front of it. And Jupiter, conveniently for astronomers, is about 10 times smaller than the Sun, so it blocks about 1% of the light. Earth is 10 times smaller still. It's that little dot there on the far right. So we're talking about a percent of a percent drop in brightness. That's about 100 parts per million. So you need a precision on the order of 20 parts per million just to find these very small planets. And you simply can't reach that precision from the ground. Why? There are two problems with that. Uh, you can't reach that precision from the ground, and two, you can't reach that level of precision from the ground. And I know I mentioned that twice, but I thought it was so important I would. So very few planets will be seen transiting their stars, and that's because if you think about planets orbiting their star, for us to see them transit, the orbital plane has to be edge on from our point of view so that you can actually see the planet block the star. Now, our galactic neighbors out there only have a 1% chance of seeing either Earth or Venus cross in front of our sun. So we have to look at many thousands of stars in order to ensure that we can find some of the planets. Here's Kepler's field of view. It's a handful of sky about the size of your palm held at arm's length. Now Hubble's field of view is the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. It makes very pretty pictures, and uh, we don't make pretty pictures, but we are able to find planets. Now you can find the field of view nestled under the left wing of Cygnus the swan as he flies over the galactic plane. And you can find our field of view if you look for Altair, the star Altair in the eagle constellation Aquila, Deneb and Cygnus the Swan, and Vega in the constellation of Lyra. So if you go out tonight and look up into the sky, well, I'm sorry, those of you who are someplace where you can actually see the stars at night, you can go out and look up into the sky tonight and find our field of view. So we launched this mission on March 7th of 2009, and a month later we released the dust cover and Kepler opened its eyes for the very first time and saw this image. This is our first light image. It has over 100 million, excuse me, yes, 100 million pixels. It's very big. 4.5 million stars are in this image. Don't start counting them, you won't have time. It's very big. This is the full moon. The full moon can fit into one of the gaps between our modules. So there are 42 CCDs, charge couple devices, similar to the chips you have in your digital cameras or in your cell phones except ours are about an inch by two inches across, rather than the size of your thumbnail. So let's zoom in on one of these CCDs. There are a lot of stars there. Yes, Dave, it really is full of stars. Now, this is a beautiful image, and I hope so, because Kepler's been snapping the same picture every half hour since April of 2009, and will continue to do so as long as the mission runs. The Kepler spacecraft itself is about the size of a minivan, as you see here. It has uh, an aperture that's about a meter across and a 1.4 meter diameter mirror at the bottom. This is the focal plane. It's the crown jewel, the heart of the instrument. You can see the CCDs that resulted in the image we just showed. 
Now, you never know when a planet's going to cross in front of a star and make the star wink at us, so you have to look all the time. That's one of the reasons we have to go to space. Now, I'd like to bring you up to speed on the discoveries we've made since we've launched. Now, before we launched, about 70 planets had been discovered to transit across in front of their star from our point of view, and here they are. You can see the orbital period in days along the bottom. You can see the size relative to Earth at the top. And you can see I've outlined uh, sizes for Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter with horizontal lines. Now, most of the planets found by this method from the ground are very large, as large or larger than Jupiter, and in very short period orbits, four days or less. That's because those are the kinds of planets you can find from the ground. In June of 2010, we released our first 44 days of data and announced the discoveries of 44, uh, excuse me, 300 planetary candidates. And here you see them in the dark blue. We're reaching down to planets that are almost as small as Earth and extending the orbital period out to 100 days. That's because of our contiguous measurements and because of the very high precision we're able to achieve. Now, just in February of this year, we, end, we released the next 90 days worth of data and we brought our total candidate count up to over 1,200, which is pretty darn amazing. And you can see that we're pushing the planets down to sizes well below that of Earth and pushing out to much farther orbital periods. And indeed, we're finding not just one planet around each star, we're finding, in many instances, multiple planets around each star. We've identified over 408 planets in 170 planetary systems. Many, many multiple planet systems. Now, we can use Kepler's laws once we find a planet. If we know the temperature of the star and the size of the star, and we know the distance to the planet, which we know from Kepler's law, then we can estimate the temperature of the planet. So that's what's shown here along the bottom. Now, we're really interested in the green region. That's the habitable zone, that range of distances for which you get liquid water pulling on the surface of a rocky planet. So, we're focusing very intently on the planets that we've, candidates that we've identified here. Now, I say candidates because we've, we've detected so many planetary candidates, we haven't had time to fully vet them all. However, we believe that over 80% of these will be bona fide planets. So, Jill Tarter and her team at SETI Institute used the Allen Telescope Array to follow up on our discoveries. Now, earlier this year, the Allen Telescope Array was mothballed but they've since been able to raise enough money through SETI STARS, and they're still collecting donations to put the Allen Telescope Array back into operation so we can determine whether or not we can find radio signals from advanced life on these planets. I'd like to introduce you to the most prolific planetary host that we've found so far. This is Kepler-11, and in the words of the lead author, it's simply supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It has not one, not two, or merely three planets orbiting it, but at least six all of which are transiting, crossing in front of the star. Now, this system is very compact. The five innermost planets are within the orbit of Mercury in our system, and the outermost planet is within the orbit of Venus. This is a very flat system. In fact, it's so compact that if you shrunk it down to the size of a compact disk, all the planets would stay within the plastic of the disk. It's so flat. So this is really amazing. It's telling us that nature loves to make flat coplanar planetary systems similar to those like the ones that we live in today, the solar system. Furthermore, it likes to make lots of small planets. In fact, we find the multiple planet systems have mainly small planets, not large planets. So Kepler needs big data and big challenges. The big data is that we have over 150,000 target stars. We collect 6 million pixels every half hour and store them. We downlink 40 gigabytes of data each month. And over the lifetime of the mission, we'll have 40 billion points in the time series from all of our targets. Now, some of those numbers don't sound big to you, but consider this, that the, uh, the bandwidth we have to the spacecraft is, is relatively small. But that doesn't mean that the challenges aren't big themselves. Instrumental effects are very large compared to the signal of interest to us. The observational noise is non-white and non-stationary, so we have to come up with adaptive techniques to find these very weak signals. There are over 100 million tests that we perform per star for planetary signatures. And this problem doesn't just get easier as time goes on, it gets harder as time goes on because the number of computations scales with the square of the number of data points. Now I'd like to tell you about some of the challenges we face in detail. So here are two light curves from two stars. The red curves are the original flux measurements we make over time. And the blue curves are the corrected data. So I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of things. Here are safe modes. 
We've had anomalies on the spacecraft that shut down the photometer, and when we come back online, the temperature has changed. That changes the focus of the telescope, it changes the shape. And the blue circles indicate areas where we've got thermal transients in the data. And these are huge, we have to get rid of them. Also, early on during the mission, we had to tweak the pointing of the spacecraft because we saw larger than expected drift in the pointing. So that introduces step discontinuities into the data. Fortunately, we know exactly when those occur. Some things we don't know when they occur are pixel sensitivity drops that occur on occasion when we have radiation damage to the CCD pixels. We have to be able to identify these and remove them before we search for planets. So the search problem for planets is like the prover proverbial search for a needle in a haystack. In fact, the Earth-sized planets are smaller than the needles compared to the bale of hay. And it's a big bale of hay, and every month we get down another bale of hay. So here we are with our pitchforks looking through the hay, and we've got a big dump truck dumping it on top of our heads, and we have to start all over again every month. So I'd like to illustrate the problem of non-white noise with this data from the sun. This is almost four years of data from the SOHO spacecraft. And the dips in the blue curve you see are caused by spots rotating in and out of view around the limb of the sun, just like the movie that you see there of a sunspot. Now, how big is an Earth-sized transit across the sun? Well, it's the same size as this image of Earth. So you can see the signature of an Earth is very small compared to the signature of a star spot. Well, how do we solve this problem? We actually have to use some very advanced techniques. We use an adaptive wavelet-based match filter to first analyze the noise in the data and then produce this particular data set. So in this image, you see the red data, which doesn't have the planetary transits in it, and you see the blue data, which does. And if you see these blue spikes, those are where the transits occur. Now, I couldn't see those in the previous slide, and I don't think you could either, but the software knows. Now, we fold the data and if at various trial periods from about half a day all the way out to the length of the mission. And if you break the data up into pieces and stack it up so the transits line on top of one another, then they add coherently, and you get a really big spike. And there's our Earth at 320 days, the period that we put into the data. So you see Kepler is revolutionizing the field of exoplanets. We've discovered well over 1,200. That's more than doubling the number of planets that we know inside our galaxy. In fact, that means that there are many, many billions of planets in our galaxy since we're looking at only 150,000 stars. We're finding that small planets are more common than large planets. And that looks very promising in terms of finding worlds similar to Earth that are capable of hosting life. Now, you might have heard last week we announced the discovery of a planet similar to Tatooine. It's not orbiting just one star, it's orbiting two stars. And this is an image of uh, the small planet Tatooine uh, silhouetted against the two stars it orbits. And we are finding that multiple planet systems are quite common. So the challenge is great, but each day we're getting closer and closer to finding an Earth-Sun analog, somewhere that you and I might like to be someday. So if we have a little time, I would like to show you this video of Kepler-16b. So it's an amazing system. Uh, Lawrence Doyle and I started looking for planets around circumbinary stars almost 20 years ago, and we finally found one. So it orbits at a distance of uh, Venus in our own solar system about these two stars. One is about 70% the mass of the sun, the other about 20% the mass of the sun. They're much cooler than the sun. One is orange and the other is red. And the stars orbit in a 41-day period orbit, and the planet orbits in a 229-day period orbit, similar to Venus. Now, Venus is quite toasty in our own solar system, but Tatooine, uh, well, on a really warm day, it's a really cool day in Antarctica on Tatooine. So I wouldn't pack my bags anytime soon. At any rate, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, and I hope you keep looking up into the stars and following our progress as we find additional planets. Thank you. Thank you.